to part five of our North American Division Adult Ministries Digital Discipleship and Evangelism webinar series with digital strategist, Mrs. Jamie Dom. And Jamie, value is really being added to the ministries of all of us. Our topic for tonight is how to build strong digital strategies for our local church ministries. I'm J. Alfred Johnson II, your North American Division Adult Ministries Director. Before we hear from Jamie, let's talk to the Lord. Loving Lord, we thank you so much for sending digital strategist, Sister Jamie Dom, to us. You have gifted her and she has blessed us each time we have heard from her. We pray now a special fresh baptism of your Holy Ghost power upon us. May we receive what you have to offer us this evening. We anticipate it and thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks again for being with us, Jamie. And now we're gonna turn it right over to you. Thank you so much. And it is an honor to be back. I'm very excited to talk today about the foundations of digital strategy. Now this foundation we're gonna talk about, these are building blocks and anybody can do this, whether you're a church, whether you're a conference, whether you're a local ministry, or even if you're just thinking of venturing out as a, as a digital missionary, you can use these building blocks to structure your own foundation for a strategy that you can then build the digital discipleship and evangelism model on top of. So let's get started and I'll share my screen. So today's topic, how to build a strong digital strategy for your church or ministry, and this even applies for personal ministries, personal brands, etc. So today we're going to cover the role of leadership because I'm sure that many of you who are watching this, you are in leadership positions. Um, how to establish your brand. So oftentimes, you know, and th this goes beyond, you know, those general brand guidelines as far as like font and color, but include some of that. It, and it really gets to the heart of how you want to be known. Establishing goals, making sure you have a purpose and understanding how to track that purpose. Making sure you're choosing the right platforms for your audience. And then of course, developing integrative communication strategies and then some general best practices. So this is gonna be an information packed presentation but again, we're going to make this presentation available and any other additional resources available as well. So I just want to be, start by saying, oops, in a world of competing attention it has never been more important to strengthen our digital curve appeal. The stakes of the gospel calling are too high. Your church, your conference, your ministry, even your own personal digital evangelism efforts can no longer go without a strategy to reach people with our messages of hope and wholeness it is imperative that we become just as effective as secular organizations at uh, using digital media for communication and community building so in this presentation you'll learn about how to establish your brand set goals all the other stuff we mentioned and you're going to learn so much more so by following the principles outlined in this presentation you'll be able to establish a strong foundation for implementing a comprehensive digital discipleship and evangelism strategy. Now, I understand that for many of you, um, especially maybe in small rural churches or, or elsewhere, you may be facing criticism to these ideas, or you may even be um, facing criticism from your church board or other members of your church, but this is now, this is a necessity. This is no longer optional. And like I said before, I believe God is using COVID to close the church doors so that we can figure out how to do church without a building and realize the potential that we have as a church, as a people, 24 seven extension of the worship experience and the community and the faith community that we can have. So I do want to, when you're facing criticism, I want to give you a few talking points that you can use to help convince others to join your vision. Because really what we are as leaders, so we're vision casters, right? So of course we understand that every missionary effort must have its foundation in Christ, but this does not negate our responsibility to educate ourselves in the most effective ways to reach people with the tools available. Because remember, people's needs don't change, but our tools, our technologies, and the methods in which we reach people change constantly. Going back to the Exodus 4, what is in your hand? When God asked Moses, what is in your hand? So today, 
we have tools and technologies, we should lean into this, we should embrace, embrace it. Because I have witnessed too many situations where we, we, we don't plan ahead, we don't have the right pieces and component. And what I see is a lost opportunity. I think of this as a stewardship. I think of how much more effective we could be if we practice good stewardship through proper organization planning and communication best practices. So if somebody is, you know, criticizing your desire to embrace these ideas, it's it's a matter of, you know, answering the call to, to use what we have in our hand to adapt, to meet people where they are, but it's also a matter of good stewardship. So um, I think we should take this wisdom seriously and do everything we can to share the gospel effectively, leaving what we cannot do to the Holy Spirit. So oftentimes we'll create events or we'll create programs or whatever we expect the Holy Spirit to do, you know, everything. And I actually think we can do a better job of being strategic in our approach and then we'll be blessed so much more. Our efforts will be blessed so much more and God will be glorified so much more. So what does this mean for leaders? So as leaders, you can help by casting that vision, by encouraging people to understand where you want to go. And you can do this through including digital strategies in your short and your long-term visions and goals. You can even dedicate funds and people to social media promotions. You can dedicate time for training you and your staff or volunteers. Thank you for joining us tonight. Forward these presentations to others. You know, give them time and give them, you know, the opportunity to get training in these areas. You know, get the digital discipleship and evangelism book for your for your members um, so that they can, your staff members or your volunteers, so they can understand these ideas better. You can identify staff for volunteers who can take on social media as part of their job duty. So in some cases, this might mean taking something off their plate. And I and I cannot stress this enough. Please invest in young people. Give them space to utilize their skills. They are digital natives and they are asking for opportunities to be involved in ministry in a way that is relevant and meaningful for them. And that is using the tools and technologies that are so intimately integrated in their lives. And you know, part of it is also just getting out of the way, let innovation happen. It might look a little different than what you're used to, but let young people be creative. Take risks yourself, be creative. And of course, you know, take advantage of all the free resources, classes, and case studies on sdadata.org or get the book at jdim.digital slash book, or even just, you know, forward the NAD adult ministries landing page with this, this whole training series on it um, to, to others who are participating in your ministry. Now, let's talk about branding to, to kick this off with. Branding is the process of revealing a holistic picture of an organization to its audience by curating a perception, an experience, or an essence. So brands are communicated, not just created. A brand, and we often don't realize this, but a brand is based entirely upon a person's experience with your organization. So the question we need to begin by asking is how do you want your organization to be known? This is your brand. So once you answer your organization's mission and purpose, you can then shape your brand around these goals because unfortunately for too often, our churches are a building on the street and now they're an empty building on the street when we should be centers for positive influence. We should find niches, we should find ways to minister and improve the well-being of our community, we should be known in the community and we should be known for reflecting Christ in all that we do. And how you answer that previous question, how you want to be known, will help you determine your brand name or your social media handle. So some of you guys may already have your handles or your brand name, but you know this is an opportunity to kind of consider some options. If you want to rebrand or brand for the first time, you know, components of your brand strategy should cover three areas. And this is marketing, public relations, and corporate communication. And I want you to think of marketing as kind of that outreach or it's evangelism. And corporate com communications, corporate communications, that's internal. So that's Adventists talking to Adventists. That's us talking to ourselves, if that makes any sense. 
And then, um, you, you know, you have this, and that's the in reach, that corporate communications. Well, public relations can kind of be understood as what the general community knows or thinks about your church or organization. So it's a blend of both that in reach and that outreach. So if you don't already have a ministry name, a website domain, and a social media handle, choose a name based on your organization's mission or purpose that can be used across all channels. Now, I will say this is not in conflict with the NAD branding. You know, NAD branding is the, the official name of your church, the colors, the fonts, all that kind of stuff. We're talking about the name, the mission, vision of your social media handles. So for established, you know, ministries, you may intentionally devise handles and constructing social media profiles can help you reshape or rebrand your image and voice for your online audiences. So when we look at these three buckets, if you will, if you look at the evangelism bucket, the marketing bucket, this is the, the creativity area. So this is where you get, um, you know, handles like Gorgeous to God, which is an NAD uh, women's ministry. And that connects, that name connects to the mission of the vision. It's what people want. We want people to associate with that brand um, for young women. When we look at the public relations, a good example of that combination between inreach and outreach is End It Now, which has that emotional component of ending abuse, but then it's branded with NED because it's a it's a it's a mission of the North American division. So you have that community awareness and influence. And when you look at corporate, this is where we get sort of those those um, communication those communication lines from you know, the conference, the union, the division, this is where the name is centered around the organization name, like NAD Adventist or Allegheny East Conference or whatever else you have that's, you know, for, for those internal audiences, talking to members, those official statements, those policies, those beliefs, and what have you. So when you're making this decision, when you're brainstorming, you want to base your decisions based on the vision you want to cast. So determine whether your primary goal for your digital missions falls into either the outreach, inreach, or public relations area. So it's possible that your mission may cross over into more than one area, and then you can brainstorm name, handle ideas with your team, your board, your members that can fit into one, two, or all of the three categories below. And so for a local church, you may choose more of a public relations or a corporate entity. You may choose a handle that reflects the name of the church, and then you might have a sub-brand that's sort of the missionary effort, something like one of the organizations I'm working with, you know, Candid Conversations, um, where that's definitely an evangelistic, that's an outreach name. And so depending on what you're doing, you might have any number of blend, or you might have more than one, uh, you know, more than one initiatives that cross into diff different categories. So your brand strategy and your digital strategy actually work together and are part of that overarching brand communication strategy that includes, and it does not replace, I can't emphasize this enough, it doesn't replace traditional means of outreach and marketing as well as that in-person experience. So, you know, you'll hear me talk about this holistic, really thinking about all the touch points, whether that's in-person, whether that's, um, you know, services that they experience or whatever. It's your brand should do a multitude of things, and that is promote awareness about your services, about who you are, foster that emotion of connectedness and, and, and what you want to be known for. What do you want people to think and feel when they, when they hear your brand, when they interact with your brand? And it should communicate your mission and your value. This is your brand story. It should encourage brand ambassadors, meaning Getting people excited about your causes. When we were talking about content evangelism, we said the number one reason people share um, content online is because they think it'll improve the lives of others. They also share content online because it gets them excited about causes or things that they believe in. Get people excited, have them sharing your content, have them have this positive association with your brand, You know, no matter which of the three tracks you take with it. And of course, the other thing it does is it helps shape expectations for those you serve. This is your brand promise. Like what you promise to the community, what your services are, again, tied into what you want to be known for. And then it also, and this is super important, it provides strategic directions to your team and it sets those clear goals, you know, 
goals and objectives, that mission vision, so that your team members you know how they fit into the overall strategy, how what they can do, and it gets them thinking creatively along the right track. Now, I will say this: um, you know, be developing your brand and your overall communication strategy, or even just developing it for the first time, takes a lot of behind the scenes homework. So you want to involve people in your team throughout the process so they could share ownership and add new insights you may not have considered. So, you know, include young people, include your board members, include your elders, you know, really think creatively about what it is that you want to accomplish in the community and how you want to be known. Now, um, the brand basics, it's basically composed of three areas. You have your brand, this is its logo, its color, its typefaces, its images, its design, its tone of voice, and its customer service. Now, the cool thing is NAD Branding has taken care of your logo, color, typefaces, et cetera. Now it's up to you for your images and your tone of voice, and of course, that customer service, that, that point of content, of contact, of how people experience your brand, how they experience your ministry, and um, how that, what associations they build with that. Of course, your brand strategy, that defines the organization's central message and how to say it. This is the way you can rally all your volunteers, your team behind it so that they know how to shape and how to communicate and how, how they fit into the plan. But of course, your brand guidelines, that's the system of managing your brand visually. Now, the biggest problem I see with ministries using social media is that they have no clear objectives. So you must determine your purpose and shape your online communications and brand accordingly. And then you also have to determine your target audience, your goals, your key performance indicators, which we'll discuss shortly. And I highly suggest that you conduct a thorough communications and social media audit, examining all your touch points. So all of this has to be heavily informed by all the ways that you interact with people. So when I'm talking about this, I mean, be consistent. This helps prevent brand confusion internally and externally. So whether you're starting from scratch or rebranding, you want to make sure your web domain, your handles, and this all matches your ministry's name and mission to reinforce your brand across multiple channels and touch points so that every time somebody interacts with you, they get the same message, the same experience, and they understand what you're known for in the community. So one way to establish your brand consistency or protect your brand consistency is to reserve your name on all platforms. Now, I'm not recommending that you have 15 different social media platforms and run them all. This is just simply to protect your brand. So someone can't start like another brand or use your domain um, like let's say you have a .org and they reserve the same name .com, you want to make sure you reserve their several domains to protect your brand, your handles on a myriad of different platforms to protect your brand so other people can't use it and create brand confusion. You want to use a consistent name, um, something short, simple, easy to spell, easy to remember, you know, no numbers, symbols, or punctuations, because you want it to be consistent across all the different social media um, platforms, and you want to use the same photo and consistent design look. So what happens is when you make sure your social media profiles all look consistent, use the same name, have the same look and feel, it makes you recognizable no matter how people are searching for you. You can use the same headline, blurb, and bio, develop a consistent tone of voice. Now, there may be an exception to that if you have like a sub-branch of your ministry, your church that's geared towards youth, that's going to have a different feel, that's going to have a different tone, but for the most part, really think consistently across all the channels, and then of course, clearly articulate what you do and offer through your mission, your brand promise, and your brand story. You want to communicate your value to the community that you are trying to serve. Now, our digital presence is an extension of our church brand and voice into the online world. As I said before, your brand is how your church and ministry is perceived. And unfortunately, right now, our church is an empty building more often than not, where we should be centers for positive influence. Now, when we think about how we feel about brands that we interact with, we realize that how we feel about a brand 
ultimately stems from our experience with it. So you want to put yourself in the shoes of someone experiencing your brand for the first time or a long time member. Um, think of, you know, different people you're trying to reach and interact with and how they might perceive your brand and view your ministry through another's perspective and even an outsider's perspective. And you want to, you know, evaluate that experience objectively and make changes based on your communication objectives. When you develop a clear brand promise, that is what your organization has to offer. That is your unique value proposition as to why people should be engaged with you, why they should care about your content. Um, so you wanna make sure all aspects of your organization deliver on that promise. So again, we talked about in the previous sections how there shouldn't be a disconnect between what people experience in the digital space and what they might experience on site for like a food drive or even the church service. You wanna think about all those touch points and see where the breakdown can happen. And if you're wondering, you know, about how to take a holistic approach to the seeker experience, utilize all your brand touch points. And you can use this as a guide to kind of start thinking about what your different brand touch points might be to make sure you tell one consistent story. You know, remember the seeker doesn't experience their journey in silo. So when I came to the Evans Church so many years ago, I don't view my experience, the research I did online, separate from what I experienced in person. And the same is true with the people you're interacting with. They don't view the, the, the person who picks up your phone or your answering service as separate from you if the person's rude or if you know the greeter experience when they come in the door or how, how they experience when they came for like, you know, to drop off toys for tots at Christmas, or they came to, you know, pick out food or, or other services that you were offering to the community, as well as your worship service. They're not going to view your worship service different than your community services. You really want to think about all the different touch points that a person might have with you and determine where there might be some weak places where you can, um, there's areas for improvement and how you can communicate through all these different avenues what your brand promise is, what your mission vision is, and how you want people to perceive you. Now, the interesting thing is when we really dig deeper into this is how your online followers and community perceive your ministry actually influences their perception of not only the church corporately, but God. So even if you haven't put any effort into creating or managing your brand, in the absence of your story, people are filling in the blanks themselves. And for many people, your digital voice may be the only opportunity your followers have to see Christ's love demonstrated in their lives. So if we go all the way back to that first presentation, we know that over 80% of people didn't attend church regularly even before COVID. So all your touch points with the community, your online services, everything, that is how they are going to learn about Christ. That is how they have the opportunity to interact with life-changing content and our messages of hope and all this. So you want to, um, you know, think of all the ways that you develop your plan as part of the seeker's journey and how you can um, communicate more fully what it is you want people to know about your brand and what it is you want them to know about Christ and how you can put Jesus on display in all aspects of your ministry. Now, we must have a clear understanding of who we are and be able to clearly demonstrate our mission, vision, and value. So you want to create a brand that your target audience can recognize and connect with in a meaningful and positive way. So to help you with that, I actually added some more resources. There's a blog link here that you guys can go visit. I highly, highly recommend going through the story brand process. We actually did this for our personal ministry, Angels in the Glen, and it was extremely helpful to really help us shape our ideas and what our brand promise was. And then Noam is really great for checking availability of social media handles and reserving them. And then GoDaddy is great for domains. Of course, there's other alternatives, but those are just the ones that I particularly like. So now that we've talked about branding, let's dig into the next part, the next building block if you will. So in this next section, we're going to talk about defining your purpose for being on social media and utilizing digital tools. Because once you understand your purpose, 
which is tied to your brand, you can then frame your strategy accordingly. So then you can identify those key performance indicators for success, because I have to say many ministries and churches fall into the trap of this reactive digital communications versus proactive. We would plan, you know, nobody would plan a wedding or a big event and not send out the invitations until the last minute, right? But somehow we treat digital communication tools as an afterthought when they should be planned out alongside our regular communication methods. So we want to reshape our strategy that we're ahead of the ball. And part of this is also that idea of content as mission to being very strategic with all of our communications and all of our strategies so that we're actually ministering to people where they are. Now, understanding your purpose. Once you have your brand, what you want to be known for, then you can determine your purpose for utilizing digital tools. So too often I hear ministries or even individuals or even individual digital missionaries and they're saying, I'm online because they know they need to be. Here's the issue. You don't have a clear purpose, so how do you know if you're moving towards your goal? So uh, here are just like five buckets, some key areas that you can consider for the purpose for your ministry. This, this doesn't matter if you're a church, you know, a ministry within a church, an individual ministry, and even like a larger organization or a conference. It's these key areas will help you define the purpose for your ministry and for being online then you and your team, if you, you know, have a team or your volunteers, can then develop an ongoing approach that aims to achieve some of these objectives. So one example I put out there is to advance the gospel and positively influence your community. That's a very general one. For those of you guys who might be dealing with a more specific issue, it might be to advance the gospel um, to the unchurched, because maybe you're in a very unchurched area. and positively influence families um, or, or like, you know, help youth and young adults to come in relationship with Christ and, and stay on a positive track or, or whatever it is, it is, but you know, really consider what a clear purpose, defining that clear purpose for being online, because then everything else can fall in place once you have that element. Because once you have purpose, you can then set goals. And when you know what you're trying to achieve, you can set benchmarks for measurement and then come up with a strategy and a budget if you're going to do some paid advertising. So if we review, you have your brand, what you want to be known for, your purpose, why you're going online. So your purpose should be tied to your brand, but it should be something you specifically want to achieve through your digital communication through your digital sphere of influence. And then your goals are those trackable items that um, you can actually set that are a little bit more tangible. So when we look at some examples of goals, and again, you guys can download this presentation. I, I'm very specific because I know that for a lot of people, this is a new idea. This is something different. So I wanna give you clear ideas of what you, you can have as a goal. So for some people, it might be increase your fan base and to drive traffic to your website, because maybe you have a lot of content that's relevant to your community and your website. You have a blog, you have services, you have you know, maybe a food pantry or something like that. Increase event attendance and participation. Right now, that might be increased Bible attendance or digital evangelistic series attendance or Bible study attendance virtually, I mean, or a worship service virtually, something like that. Increase community awareness to become more than the building of the street. If you have something that you're offering the community, a food pantry, a, a mentorship program for young people, you can't help them if they don't know about it. Get to know your membership community better and understand their felt needs. So this is the idea of what did Jesus do? He attended to people's spiritual, their emotional, their physical needs first, and then he bid them come and follow. Your goal may be to better understand what those needs are through listening to these digital tools. Encourage social media ambassadors to share content and invite people to your event. So grow digital disciples. Increase meaningful engagement online. So more views, more comments, more messages, more prayer requests, whatever it is. You know, reach target groups with meaningful content. 
improve the lives of others, communicate core values, create connection to foster relationships. Maybe you're trying to reach the unchurched or the, or the people who've left the church in your area. Um, you can also, maybe your goal is to define why you're unique and why you're a resource to the community or to become a resource to the community. Our churches, our faith community should be known as the people to go to when we're in trouble. When we talked about previously about those community building, those engagers, like are we known as a safe place to go to ask questions without judgment? How do you want to be known? How can you measure and set a goal? And it could be also to just set expectation for those both who are in charge with you and your team. These are all goals that you could choose. And now, of course, I always recommend pick a few and then build up for there. Now, every ministry's goal should be to create clarity and focus. So when everybody in your team, whether that's a few people or an entire church, or even if you're just a solo digital missionary, you want to make sure you clearly understand what you're trying to achieve because it enables everybody who you're working with to find their place within your mission and you, you just have a better team that way um, and even as an individual if you're launching a digital ministry it's much easier to progress towards your goals if you know what those goals are and what your purpose is so now to evaluate effectiveness you can now dig into your performance metrics so once you've identified why you'll be using digital media and who you're trying to reach and what you're trying to achieve, then you can determine measures for success. These are often referred to as key performance indicators. It's just a fancy term. It's just performance metrics. So the type of metrics, these can include um, activity metrics. So if you're new to ministry or your, your church is new and you're just trying to um, get started with content evangelism or what have you, this is just quantity of post and content created. These are great for beginners. Um, reach metrics. So just trying to reach more people with your content, more people seeing your content, or maybe more people of a specific group seeing your content, maybe in a specific location or a specific gender or age group. Um, engagement metrics. So you want people more interacting with your brand and asking questions and stuff like that. Acquisition metrics. These are relationships developed these are you know people asking for prayer and you're having these ongoing conversations with or they're they're showing up to bible studies and stuff acquisition metrics and conversion metrics kind of overlap so these are people who are signing up for bible studies requesting resources requesting prayer you know stuff like that asking some serious questions and then across retention metrics these are brand evangelists these are happy members these are people who are have not only joined the church, but now they're going to be part of the team. They're going to participate in any way they can to help spread the message. Now, let's be real. Most of us are limited on time. Um, you or your team probably will not have time to get into all the weeds of your data. And you also just want to avoid data paralysis. And you can go as deep as you want and as expansive as you want with data. But too much can be overwhelming and it can actually be crippling. So to prevent that, I highly recommend you identify just a few key high-level metrics and track those to start. If you keep track of benchmarks and monitor change over time, perhaps even monthly, because especially in churches and ministry, we all work very hard. There's only so much we can add or only so deep we can get, but you can still make data-driven decisions if you choose wisely. Now, some of you might be wondering, well, what kind of things can we track? So these are some examples of those key performance indicators. You can go through this on your own time and you can, once you determine your brand, your goals, your purpose for going online, then you can go through and you can choose where, what metrics and what benchmark you wanna start with. But if you're just starting out, I highly recommend that you start with the metrics in that first column. So the activity metrics, the reach metrics, the engagement metric, until you firmly establish your online presence. So perhaps the first four or six months, these performance metrics are relevant to any platform, actually in either category. So if you're just getting started, this is number of posts. Reach metrics are, you know, reach impressions, views, traffic to a website or Pacific channel platform or location these are the kind of metrics that you can 
you can, you know, set and track engagement metrics. So this is, you know, quantity of followers, how many likes and shares, comments or messages you're getting. Maybe you're an active prayer ministry or you're trying to better understand the community. Are you getting questions submitted? Are you getting messages? Are you interacting and having conversations with people? And then the second column is the more advanced stuff. This is um, where you get into Bible study requests, online Bible studies, um, you know, number of volunteers signing up for things, visits to the church, donations or conversion metrics, one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, um, Bible study and resource requests, um, retention metrics. These are testimonials. These are those really great opportunities to share how God is using your ministries. This is, um, you know, understanding felt needs of you know taking those practical actions towards felt needs like how many people you've helped in the community whether you're building beds for kids who don't have beds or if you have an active food counter or whatever it is or increased involvement in community and developing an active presence in the community having that um unique value to the community these are these more advanced metrics so you've established your brand we're just reviewing now how you want to be known. That's building block one. You defined your purpose for being online. Building block two, you've set goals and you've determined a way to track your progress. So those are the first four building blocks. This should all be done within the context of your target audience, who you're trying to reach. So in our next presentation, two weeks from now, we're gonna dig deep into understanding your audience. But if you wanna get a sneak peek ahead, you can visit that URL. There's actually a downloadable worksheet that you can go through and you can really start thinking about the core values, motivating factors, and cultures acting on your audience. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to pause for a commercial break. If there's any questions when I come back, we're going to take a moment to answer those questions. And then we will go on to part two of the presentation. The Amazon Echo Dot is a hands-free voice control device that uses far-field voice recognition for voice-activated digital assistance. The North American Division Adult Ministries Department, with the aid of very talented Alexa programmers, has developed an Alexa skill for the Adult Bible Study Guide. This resource for the Echo Dot is in response to today's demanding fast-paced society, delivering on-demand audio sharing and the Daily Adult Bible Study Guide. As the program develops, there will be more commands and features programmed into the Adult Bible Study Guide Alexa skill. The North American Division Adult Ministries Department is proud to present this innovative tool for Bible study. This skill is now available in the Alexa Skill Catalog on Amazon.com. Hi, welcome back. So we're going to dig into the next part of this presentation now. So we're going to talk about matching the platforms to your audience. So remember, to reach a target audience, you must go where they spend their time online and use the language they use. Think of the digital mission field like the physical mission field. If we want to reach people, we have to go where they are. We have to go and, and be in the spaces where they're spending their time. So what I technically tend to um, recommend, because it's very easy to become overwhelmed by all the possibilities, to avoid that, I recommend starting small. Just pick a few platforms that make the most sense for your ministry, your messages, your available human resources, and your goals. It's best to pick a few platforms forms and do them well knock them out of the park because a strategy 
but a stretch too thin will not get the results you're, ho you're, ho you're hoping for. You're just not gonna be able to keep up. So once you've identified the best platforms for your target audience, then you can proceed. I'm going to take a moment to provide a brief summary of the most popular platforms that many of you may be familiar with, but I don't wanna assume anything. And then if you'd like, I can actually send and provide an in-depth um, blog article that actually goes to each of the platforms in detail with a lot more information. And you know, once you've been through these the content creators presentation, if you're if you're new to this series, go back to the content creators presentation of the digital discipleship and evangelism model, because a good part of what we're talking about here is that you can take one piece of content and repackage it across many different platforms. So let's dig into the different platforms. So the number one platform, and I highly recommend this for almost all churches, is still Facebook. Over 70% of Americans are on Facebook. It spans all ages. It does skew older, but it is highly interactive. And it's really great for community building. I highly recommend that most churches start there. Instagram, it skews younger. A lot of teens use it. It's highly visual. It's really great for creatives and recommended for young audiences. And if you don't know, Instagram, it's short videos, it's images. It's really great for storytelling. Twitter, this is a microblogging platform. It's sharing short snippets of ideas. It's skews a little bit older, but still younger than probably the average church demographic. It skews male. Great for trending topics. It's great for causes. Um, particularly cause-based ministries where there's an active ongoing conversation um, or advocacy taking place. Snapchat is ideal for young teens and 90% of them are on it. It, it mimics real life conversations because it's like these brief little 10 second interactions and then the content disappears. You can do geo filters for live events because someday we will be doing live events. Again, great for brand awareness and it's a really got a lot of potential for building relationships with local youth. So if like in your youth ministry leader or something like that, Snapchat is a great opportunity. TikTok is kind of like a mini YouTube. It's a viral video app. They're short bite-sized videos. Definitely skews younger. It's very creative. It's very collaborative. And it's ideal for creative ministry content. And things like Snapchat and TikTok, I do highly recommend that you have a youth ambassador kind of leading the way on those ministries and creating the content because they are natives to the platform. They understand the language, they understand the cultural norms and expectations. Now, the second platform that I strongly encourage for all churches because you're all creating sermons every week. It is, YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world and is primarily used for learning and entertainment. It's great for repurposing your video content to be evergreen and findable. So I recommend it for you churches to stream, but I highly recommend on my website, there's a guide for using YouTube for ministries because we shouldn't be just putting our entire services up there. That's fine for the live stream, but the sermon should be cut out and they should be repackaged and positioned and optimized for search. So we should be using the vernacular to, to position our content so that when someone's asking the question, your content comes up that will address that very question they're asking. Social media should be part of a comprehensive communication strategy that incorporates both your traditional and digital media working together to maximize impact. Remember, digital is a great way to amplify and scale up. Now, I do think with these rapid changes that we're experiencing, in some cases, digital will replace traditional, but for now, we're living in a hybrid world. Digital tools, they can amplify your message. You can reach broader, but then you can also um, get more interconnected with your audience as well. And you can listen more deeply. So, Truly effective communication strategies work across all channels and platforms to reach people where they are conveying one consistent goal or a message. So, you know, we talk a lot about that consistency across all touch points, holistic, 
um, you know, really, really, you know, being clear with your communications across all your communication strategies. And this ties into this rule of seven. So the rule of seven is a key concept behind integrative marketing. Everyone, including our audience, experiences sort of marketing messages and content overload. Like we are blasted with marketing messages and content all the time. The average adult is actually exposed to over 3,000 marketing messages and others have the number much, much higher than that. So that's how much we're receiving a day. So therein lies the challenge. And this is where the rule of seven comes in. The rule of seven states that a person needs to be exposed to a message at least seven times before they'll take a desired action, such as register, or RSVP, attend an event, request a re resource, send a message, read an article, or participate in some other meaningful way. So for us to cut through the clutter, not only do we need to be present in spaces where the conversations are happening, not only do we need to measure our content to make sure it's relevant for our audience and use the vernacular so they, they can actually find it, but we also must utilize a multi-channel, multi-platform approach. And if you're wondering, what's a channel? What's a platform? A channel just refers to the type of communication medium. So this is like radio, print, or TV, text messages, websites, social media. So like those different types. Platform is just different types of social media. And we did that platform review. Now for churches, you'll most likely want to leverage in-person interactions and conversations, website updates, text messages, flyers, group messaging tools, podium announcements, emails, and your social media profiles. All these things work together. If you find that you have trouble making sure your own congregation is informed or your own ministry is informed, start to work on inter, you know, this, this cross-channel, cross-platform communication and keep in mind the rule of seven until you are sick of your message, your audience is just starting to get it. Because together, all of these efforts help communicate your church brand. It's important to consider how each of these communication tools reflects your message and mission and ultimately Christ. So we want to follow his example for drawing people to the gospel, being strategic and just being intentional with how you orchestrate all your different ways to distribute information and make sure you use effective methods of presenting that information. So a way to improve awareness, even among your own congregation, the people you speak to on a weekly basis, utilize the, the rule of seven and be persistent and consistent with your communication. It also helps to get organized, actually. Um, you know, weaving social media into your strategy can seem daunting, but it doesn't have to be. So to be successful, you'll have to plan and organize across all your communication channels. So here are some tips for getting organized. Um, if you follow these steps, you'll be able to get a high level view of your overall content strategy and how it fits together across your communication channels. Um, so what you want to do is you want to determine roles, divide those responsibilities for who's, you know, managing which communication channel and what's going to be communicated. You can develop a content calendar. I highly, highly encourage this. It enables you to plan across all your channels and platforms. If you want some free templates, you can go to that link. I have a monthly template, template which I actually prefer. And then there's also even a daily temple, template if you're someone who wants to get into the little nitty gritty. Um, you can share the content calendar with all your communications team or volunteers, and then in, as much as possible, schedule your posts in advance. This allows for increased flexibility. And also just planning this way allows you to plan for how to repackage your content across all the different channels. So when we talked about in content evangelism, you might have one piece of content, you might have a sermon, but you can cut that out and you can repackage it for podcasting. You can cut it out and position and optimize it for search on YouTube. You can cut out a smaller clip and post that as like a wave file on Facebook as a, like a social media promo clip, or you can even pull out a pull quote and turn it into a pretty design. There's a lot of different ways that you can repackage content and planning this matter helps you think about that. Um, and if you have the book, I highly recommend that you read the chapter on the creator role section when it comes to, to planning out your content in this way.
Now let's do, it's, let's take another look at the process for building your foundation. So remember, this is all within the context of the digital discipleship model that we went through in the previous four sections. And also it's gonna be in the context of understanding your audience, which is our next session in a couple of weeks. So you wanna begin by developing your brand, defining your purpose for going online, setting goals, determining ways to measure your progress toward that goals, choosing the right platforms for your audience, develop an integrative communications plan, and then get organized. So this is the foundation. These are the elements of a digital strategy. Now, I do want to take a moment and cover some best practices um, to keep in mind while you're implementing your strategy. This will help you a lot. So um, scheduling your content, and I would even say your ads, if you're doing ads in advance, helps you focus on the big picture items without that urgency of consistent posting. So when you plan out regular content in advance or how you're going to repackage your content, it takes the guesswork away. And then as much as possible, you can actually schedule it in monthly or two week chunks, whatever you know you or your team can do. Then because you'll be freed up, like let's say you take an hour every other week just to schedule the content in advance. Um, because you're freed up, this actually allows you to focus your attention on engagement, community building, data analysis, strategic planning, and other projects. If you divide your content creation roles between multiple people, they know what day of the week they're supposed to post, what kind of content, then they can also proactively work towards that. And then whoever needs to can focus on these other elements. This empowers you to be more proactive in your digital strategy, opposed to that reactive, always responding to what's going on and putting up content maybe just behind the ball, um, this allows you to also be freed up to respond quickly to comments or address any other unexpected issues or changes. So remember that engagement strategy, because if you're, if you're caught up in the tyranny of needing to constantly post content, then you're not necessarily paying attention to your inbox, or you're not paying attention to your engagement or your analytics or the questions people are asking. This is actually, it's, it's a time management principle as well. Keep it interesting. So what this means is you want to utilize a diversity of content and media to keep your audience engaged and interested with relevant content. We talked about this in the content creators um, presentation as well. So when you use a diversity of content, this also helps you with search engine optimization and it helps you speak to different audiences or find and position relevant content for different age groups. Um, keeps it broader. Social media, as you heard me say a bunch of times, it's about building relationships and telling your story in a way that your audience understands the core value of your brand and engages with your content. So what this means is the ideal ratio of posts of an organization or a ministry should be 80% engagement and 20% direct appeals. So too often we go about it backwards. Most of our content is promoting events or promoting, promoting something like an event or a product or a come to our service when it should be going back to what Jesus said and 80% of our content should be fulfilling a need before we bid them come and follow. So in that 80% of content, you can meet people's need. You can demonstrate the need their organization feels. You can share what initiatives your ministry is doing and what's happening in your community. You can pull back the veil and let people see what your church community is like, what your ministry community is like, how they can fit in, um, how you plan to serve them. Um, you can showcase your impact through testimonials and you know different results, just creative ways of getting people excited about your mission and what you're doing in the community. And then that remaining 20% of content can ask for, you know, people to register for an event or volunteer or sign up for a resource or join a Bible study or take, take some other appropriate action. Commit to posting regularly. So quality of content is always going to be more important than quantity. But you need to stay engaged in the conversation. But you also don't want to post too much and overwhelm your followers. We all know people like that. And 
what happens is you end up just kind of drowning out whatever they're posting. A good cadence is one that maximizes engagement, meaning people engage with the content, showing interest, and minimizes the unsubscribe or unfollows from your account. So again, if you're creating content that is value added, that is relevant, that is improving the well-being of others, they're not going to unsubscribe. They're going to follow, they're going to share, they're going to be engaged. But you know, each audience is unique. Learn your audience. The platform review that I can share a link to um, and they can post has actual posting frequency recommendations for each platform. But like all things ministry, consistency is key. So if you can only post twice a week, be consistent with posting twice a week and have good quality content. Right for your audience. And so what this means is like, if we were going into the physical mission field, we would learn the language, we would learn the cultural norms and expectations. So make sure to use the language of the platform. Follow the principles, you know, that we outlined previously with like content creation and writing for social media. Choose strong visuals, use high quality images that invoke emotional response to tell a story. And you want to optimize your images per platform so that they look great on whatever platform you're repackaging the content for. Be creative, utilize contrast to help images stand out in the news feed. When it comes to uploading videos, you want to upload them natively to whatever platform you're using. So you want to upload them directly, in other words. So if you're on Facebook, don't share a link to YouTube. Facebook's going to throttle it. It's going to suppress that link. It wants you to upload it directly. So just something to keep in mind. If you want some tips for creating those strong social media posts, there's a link there to the resources on my website. You can download a little workbook for that. Partnerships benefit everyone. You heard me talk about this before. So you want to be sure to tag other accounts when appropriate or available. If you're going to share content from a different organization or ministry or about a different organization or ministry or about a person or about a speaker, whatever it is, um, use, you know, tag them, let them know, reference them and link to their account or website. It helps expand your reach. It gets them excited because you're talking about the partnership, you're talking about them, and maybe they'll share as well, which of course will expand your organic reach. Always link back to your website. Um, your website is your biggest marketing tool. Link back to your website and almost all your posts or as much as possible or link them to something. One of the things that really frustrates me is I'll see somebody post a picture or they'll post a video. There's no teaser language above or you might be asking them to register for something and the registration link is on an image, but the registration link is not in the description. And so it makes it really difficult for the person to take the desired action. If you want someone to visit a website URL or to take some kind of action, always provide a clickable link. For, for a platform like Instagram that needs to include the link in the bio, make sure they can easily take the action you'd like them to desire because if they have to leave the platform and type in the url you're going to lose them promote your social media um you know you can include your social media handles and names in all of your communication channels such as your website your emails your print material Whatever it is, include ways that people can get connected with you. You can build out from your own membership. Remember, we talked about leveraging our church body as a region vehicles for souls working in pods, where if you, you know, encourage them to like your page, to engage with your content, to share your content, you can build out from a membership base, but you have to make sure they know how to connect with you online. And again, going back to that, over communication, being persistent, being consistent so that your own membership is even informed. This ties back um, when, you're, when you're considering your digital strategy, really, really dig into that engager role. You want to engage in comments. You want to organize a team that can check daily for comments, question messages, and respond in a timely manner because every opportunity to connect is an opportunity to grow the kingdom of God. Do not miss these opportunities. And as always, when you initially revamp your digital strategy, 
the changes in your post engagement will show immediate and positive results, especially if you implement the ideas that we talked about as content as mission, content evangelism, and then that community building and, the, and that distribution mechanism we talked about. But over time, things may plateau or even dip, especially during holidays. With our personal ministry, remember my husband was really freaked out because like December and Christmas, everything took a nosedive. Long weekends, things take a nosedive. Um, don't get freaked out about that. You'll learn to see patterns over time. And if you're tracking and you're paying attention, you'll get more comfortable with that. You'll, you'll anticipate these yearly patterns, but keep pressing forward because often online efforts fail because people give up too early. So the first thing is they don't have a clear purpose for going online. And then once they're online, they give up too early. So be consistent, be persistent. This is the new mission field. God wants us in the digital mission field. We have to keep pressing forward. We never know how many souls we're going to reach. If you're interested in more resources, there's some at sdadata.org, which was the website I put together when I was at the North American Division. Um, okay. And if you'd like to get the book, it is available in print and a digital format from Avent Source and Amazon. Um, you can learn more at the website, jdim.digital slash book. If you've missed the other videos or any other videos in this series, we have one more coming up in two weeks. Go to nadadultministries.org. They have all the whole video series there for you to check out. So at this point, we're going to take a commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to answer your questions. The Amazon Echo Dot is a hands-free voice control device that uses far-field voice recognition for voice-activated digital assistance. The North American Division Adult Ministries Department, with the aid of very talented Alexa programmers, has developed an Alexa skill for the Adult Bible Study Guide. This resource for the Echo Dot is in response to today's demanding fast-paced society, delivering on-demand audio sharing and the Daily Adult Bible Study Guide. As the program develops, there will be more commands and features programmed into the Adult Bible Study Guide Alexa skill. The North American Division Adult Ministries Department is proud to present this innovative tool for Bible study. This skill is now available in the Alexa Skill Catalog on Amazon.com. Hello again. So we're going to begin with a question from Allison Down, and she asks, does the North American Division have resources we can access in order to get started? Again, I, when I was, I was at the North American Division for four and a half years, and I poured my heart and soul into sdadata.org. That is a great resource for you to really start digging into a lot of these principles. The, the other resources for individuals or people to get started, and I know this sounds like a shameless plug, but again, I pushed this book. I don't get any royalties from it, but I poured my heart and soul. This is my brain, digital discipleship and evangelism. There is a ton of information in here for individuals, for ministries, and um, you know, I know I, I've done a bunch of other series with other groups and stuff like that. So depending on what questions you have, you can also always visit my website, jdim.digital, and ask me a question. I can um, refer you to some other resources as well. I have resources on how to move members um, from viewers to, to active digital disciples. And if you want to know about YouTube, we have downloadables at jdim.digital. If you want to know how to write for social media, 
also jdim.digital um, understanding your audience worksheet. There's just a lot of resources up there. It's the only thing that isn't free is the book, but you can get that as a digital download. So I believe about like 95 or something like that. So I hope that answers your question. Are there any other questions or thoughts or anything you guys would like to share tonight? Or if you have any questions from any of the previous series, if you're just catching up or you're just joining us today, um, if there's anything you'd like me to repeat, I'm always happy to do that. You guys can also tell me where you're coming from. I can see people visiting my website from Winter Garden, Florida. I can see people from Bermuda. And I can see people from, let's see here, Toronto and South Carolina. So welcome everybody. And um, again, it is my sincere wish, it is my sincere prayer that these ideas catch fire because I believe that the, the, the Advent movement was started by a grassroots movement. I believe that the local churches, individuals and ministries can really lead this digital awakening because it's never been easier to reach around the world with our message of hope and wholeness. And I'm not sure our messages have ever been more needed than they are now. So I encourage all of you to just be empowered, be equipped, answer that call to ministry. And let me know if you have any questions. I see somebody from Washington State, Bonnie Link as well. Oh, here's a question. What do you suggest for ministries that have multiple initiatives for different audiences? Do you mean in terms of branding or strategy? So for, I, I understand what position this person is coming from. So if you have like a larger corporate brand and you have many little sub brands underneath, I would suggest that you develop a strategy for your overall, your overarching strategy for your larger brand. And then when it comes to your individual, like, We'll call them product lines. So your individual initiatives that you have a clear understanding of all of these elements for those individual ministries. So if you're a larger organization with several um, different initiatives going on, it's a little extra work. I would encourage you that you go through this process for each one of your different initiatives and for each one of your just, um, different initiatives you go through the understanding your audience workbook so that you can really understand the personas and who you're trying to reach with all these different initiatives because that's going to shape your content evangelism. That's going to shape what platforms you're on. That's going to shape your language, the style in which you communicate, how often you communicate. So it takes a lot of work for larger organizations. I worked at the Smithsonian for many years. Um, and we just had a million different product lines going and we had to go through these exercises for every single one of those products. But I can tell you that it is worth it because you'll have a clear understanding of who you're trying to reach and what you're trying to achieve. And that can really actually, believe it or not, save time, save money in the long run so that you have that clear direction. Do you suggest polling your different social media audiences? I, well, if you're talking about different platforms and you can see who's currently following you and stuff like that, it's hard to get people to actually participate in those kind of polls. Um, we'll talk about this more in depth in the next section, but I do strongly encourage you, you poll and you study your individual audiences. So if you have an email list, if you're like an individual church, for example, you can um, reach out to your members and ask them, you know, direct questions. You can make it anonymous um, if, if that's helpful. If you're trying to reach out to your local community, a lot of data, a lot of information, you can find out about them online. But one of the things that, you know, Jesus did is he came close to people and he listened to them. So it might even mean just having those one-on-one -on -one conversations, talking to the people you're trying to reach to better understand their needs. You can send out polls. It's always super helpful, but just know that the polls are always going to be skewed by the people who willingly participated, which ideally it'd be great to get everybody to participate. 
but do include that in your overall data collection when you're trying to understand your audience and understand what felt needs you're trying to address and understand what content would be most relevant to them. Any other questions? Well, you guys, it's been fun. Um, it's, you know, I'm excited to have gone through this series with you. I'm always excited to share this. This is my favorite topic. And I just want to thank you for spending these weeks with me, spending this time with me. And I look forward to speaking to you with part six. This, we're going to go into a deep dive into understanding your audience. And this is going to go beyond just the surface level of demographics. This is going to go into the drivers in society, understanding core values, understanding the culture, the idea of cultural empathy. Um, yeah. Oh, here's another thought. Um, someone's saying the church was started by grassroots, but the majority were in their 20s. Yes. And I think that's something that we have forgotten. And that doesn't mean that the older generation doesn't have a place in this. You absolutely have a place in this. You're the leaders. You're the ones who can make room. You're the ones who can cast this vision. But I think now is a great opportunity to, to empower the younger generation to lead this initiative. They are digital natives. So those of us who are older, thank you for the health message. I don't look my age. But for those of us who are older, we have an opportunity to get out of their way and to encourage them and to legitimize this as mission work, as their calling to, to allow them to take this around the world, but they need our support. They, you know, they, just as, you know, we can mentor down, they can also mentor up because they can share their wisdom as far as like the, the norms and stuff on these different platforms, but they have, so much untapped potential. And so, yes, I believe we all have a role in this. Again, I believe multi-generational um, is best because there's so much we can learn from each other, but this is an opportunity to, to let the youth lead because for so long we've forgotten that and we're afraid to give, you know, 20 somethings or teenagers the, the access to our Instagram account or let them start a TikTok account and, and share the gospel. We, we teach them that it's dangerous or that they can't be trusted um, helping the church in this way. And that's completely backwards. They should be leading. They should absolutely be leading and we should be you know, creating that space for them. So I just want to end with, thank you guys. I hope that's some good food for thought. Um, <laughs> every time I try and close up, another question comes in. Okay, so Robin Davis is asking, what are you doing now if you're not at the North American Division? So I am working from home as a part-time consultant and doing digital strategies primarily for the Adventist Church because that is where my heart is, but it allows me to balance being a mom to a 17-month-old and being home with her and, you know, that work-life balance that, you know, is so hard to get when it comes with, with ministry. And then the other thing is I have launched a personal digital ministry with my husband, Angels in the Glen. It's basically me putting my money and my effort where my mouth is. And if you want to go check it out, we're on YouTube. Since our launch in less than a year, we've reached over 325,000 views on YouTube using all these principles. We have over 44, I think, 100 subscribers. 3,000 people on our email list, over 60,000 watch hours of these end time truths, Daniel and Revelation videos. And so we are, um, we, are, we are showing what could be done with just two people launching into the digital missionary space. And I'm really humbled by how God is blessing our little ministry. At our next meeting, can you share an example of a brand that allows us to get people excited? Yeah, I can definitely do that. Um, I can share a couple. You know, there's ones that come to mind are, I mean, I hate to say it, but if we look at the corporate stuff, it's like REI and, and stuff like that. Like, get outside, you know, share what you're doing. Um, there's also, you know, I think ministries like 
Gorgeous to God that I've mentioned before, that are doing a really good job with relevant content. Um, we're launching a series kind of conversations down um, for Mount Fuzge in Florida. Um, we have a lot of buzz around Angels in the Glen. I think people like Justin Koo and Caleb Isley with their Humans of Adventism, that is getting people really excited. People share their stories on those testimonies like crazy because it's practical because it's real it's true life stories those are brands that are doing digital ministry right yeah all right so god bless you guys next time as i said before i'm going to tune out now but next time we are going to dig into understanding your audience for effective communication and for content evangelism in the next section because we have to to meet people where they are to understand their felt needs to 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 understand their emotional physical needs and their their spiritual needs we have to understand them deeper to create the content that can meet them where they are before we give them come and follow so i hope you'll tune in next week um, thank you and God bless. I'll see you next week. Thanks, Jamie, for helping us to understand how to build strong digital strategies for our ministries. Next time on March 23 at 7 p.m. Eastern, you're going to show us how to understand our audiences for effective communication. And speaking of audiences, we want to just say thank you for being with us tonight. And please, keep on liking us on Facebook and also keep on subscribing to our YouTube channel and by all means remembering to click the bell. We also want to express appreciation to you for inviting your friends to participate with you always and for planning to do the same for our next presentation. You know something? We're always interested in hearing from you and so we're interested in learning how this series is impacting and bringing life to your digital strategies. So please contact us on our website at nadadultministries.org and just go to the contact us page or you can do it an easier way. You can just go ahead to the chat right now and leave a comment for us. Either way you do it, we are grateful for your input and we thank you so, so very much for it. We've had a good time with you this evening. And so let's praise God for giving us tonight's webinar in prayer. Oh, thank you, Lord. You were with us this evening. We pray that you would please give us the ability to internalize all of the things that we have learned from Sister Dom this evening. Give us the ability to put them into practice. Let your spirit be upon her and let your spirit be upon us as we go forward in your work. Your will be done, your kingdom come. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm J. Alfred Johnson II, your adult ministry director, and I want to say thank you again to you, Jamie, and thank you. We value and appreciate you, our audience. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Mm -hmm.